Hello and uh, welcome to my video titled The Existence of God, an Articulation of Belief. Uh, God being in parentheses there, mind you. Uh, first, before I get into this, uh, this video is going to be sloppy. I have to admit to you, I have a very limited human body and mind, as well as very little actual skill in terms of video editing. Uh, to do any kind of like actual fancy effects I would really want to do to express some of these complex ideas. Uh, in truth, this is basically just going to be a slideshow I created in Paint.net to... Well, let's get into this. This video is not here to prove the existence of any form of God, but to articulate a philosophical foundation for belief in one specifically to articulate my philosophical and absolutely certain belief in a supreme being or god. In order to do this, we first have to define what the word god means. You can't argue anything unless your premise is defined. For this video, I'm going to propose and get into five possible definitions which we're going to go through. Briefly, these definitions are one, a powerful being or life form, more intelligent and capable than humanity. Two, an element of consciousness that transcends the individual. Three, a supreme being, more intelligent or powerful than any other possible life form. Four, a prime mover or original designer of all possible universes. For this definition, not necessarily alive. Uh, and five, a non-literal manifestation of a collective belief system or doctrine through the actions of its believers slash enactors. To get into definition one, this is probably our most straightforward and easy to grasp definition. Essentially, this is a being or life form more intelligent or capable than humanity. Pretty easy to grasp of. Some ideas of more powerful beings than us include such conceptions as Thor, Mars, Horus, or really any type of pagan god, or demon, or angel, or being which is above humanity but not necessarily supreme in the universe. This being would possess intelligence, awareness, aptitude, or potential powers beyond those of human beings. Most conceptions of this type of being indicate that a plethora of them exist simultaneously and they have varied and intermixed qualities amongst them. I find it that these gods are pretty much almost guaranteed to exist at some point in the universe. Maybe not simultaneous to us right now, uh, but it's essentially a given that they're going to exist at some point. However, it's pretty unlikely that a being of this nature would be aware of humanity, and even more limited that they would be interested in coming into contact with humanity or cooperating with us. Not impossible, mind you. I pretty much see it as certain this type of god will exist because if you take the fundaments of natural selection and evolution across a universal scale, uh, I don't think humanity is the final product of such a thing, especially on the plethora of potential life-bearing worlds across a universe as vast as ours. However, that inverse quality of the vastness of the universe and the potential number of life forms across it uh, is also the same reason why they probably don't know about us or have any interest in contacting us. Uh, the universe, mind you, even just the observable universe that we have any possibility of ever seeing, uh, is fucking massive. So any idea... Essentially, unless these beings have the ability to transcend space, which they may be able to do, but we can't really predict that. Uh, it may be literally impossible that they know of our existence uh, or can reach us. Um, even if they can, and if they have the ability to do so, uh, there's very little chance that a being so advanced would have a purpose for us other than maybe observation or light experimentation. Definition 2 of the word God is an element of consciousness that transcends the individual. Uh, this is essentially equatable with the psychedelic state of ego death, uh, or religious concepts where when you die, when the body dies, uh, consciousness does not cease, it continues uh, seamlessly. Uh, in this kind of definition of God, 
Uh, consciousness is a constant universal state, and it's not confined to any one individual body or any one limited form. To try and conceptualize what ego death is, I made this little series of images. In image one, you have the existence of everything uh, that is, was, or ever will be. Uh, and I mean everything. All existence. In infinity, for all you care. It's a picture of the universe. Then you have two. Uh, you, a little monkey here. Uh, and you're a piece of everything. You're a part of it. Your ego is your own natural perception or separation between you and everything. Uh, essentially, you go, I am the monkey, and everything else is not me. However, if your ego dies, or more accurately, if you die, then the consciousness does not go away. Consciousness being awareness. Uh, and you become aware of everything as sort of yourself. I wrote the word me over the picture of universe on number four there, but you would have no concept of self or other or me or you. It simply is. Uh, everything is, regardless of your perception of it. Um, while I do believe in transcendental consciousness, I'm not necessarily going to be arguing for it as the definition of God I believe in for this video. Uh, with all things being transcendentally conscious, you kind of struggle to create a boundary between God and everything else. Uh, seeing as that with transcendental consciousness, no boundaries actually exist. I have a picture here of the uh, eye of providence, or of an all-seeing eye, and this comes in for definition three, a supreme being, much different than definition one. I put in some possible attributes of what a supreme being would mean here. Uh, one of those would be internal, either continuatively or incarnatively, meaning that it will repeatedly come about into existence if it dies. Uh, Second, and this is a given, is that it must be, oh, second and third, it must be both the most powerful and the most intelligent possible being. Uh, essentially, nothing greater than it can exist. No more supreme life form is physically, chemically, scientifically possible to exist. It's the top dog of all top dogs. Four, it's the unification of all possible matter and energy in the universe. This is why it's the most powerful possible being, because it is the unification of everything, meaning that nothing can possibly unify more than it and become greater than it. And five, not necessarily a given, but it's the creator, the ruler, and the sustainer, essentially meaning that it is the prime mover of the universe, the living prime mover. It is the king of the universe, or the being in charge of the universe. <coughs> And it is the being that sustains the cycle of the universe uh, and ensures its continued existence. This is the definition that I'm going to argue for my own belief in God. Uh, we're going to come back to it, though, because this argument is going to be the meat of what I have to talk about. And I'd like to get onto the other two definitions first. Uh, once again, here's a picture of uh, Jesus Christ with the eye of providence or the all-seeing eye over him for your consideration of what a supreme being means. So, definition four is a non-living prime mover or creator. I talked about how, in definition three, the supreme being could potentially be a prime mover or a creator. However, this is simply the philosophical concept of a prime mover and not necessarily living. Um, a prime mover is essentially a metaphysical given, it's, it's guaranteed, uh, and it's been used to philosophically argue for the existence of something called God many times before. Um, but I'm not going to use it as my main argument, because I'm trying to argue for something that is conscious, living, aware, and existent within the universe, and not simply a, let's call it, chemical or physical causal agent. So to explain it from my conception of what a prime mover means, I gave you a little diagram here. So you have something, right? You have matter, and it's moving. 
from something to something to something to something. You could put whatever you want here. You could put a ball bearing, knocks into another ball bearing, and now the ball bearing is three degrees to the right. And that knocks into another ball bearing, it's another three degrees to the right. So something causes something else to happen. That something else causes something else to happen. That something inversely causes something else to happen. The prime mover is the causal agent that caused the cycle of something causing something to happen. Essentially, something had to come before everything else. And, well, metaphysically, if something came before everything else, then something came before the something that came before everything else. It's an infinite cycle moving backwards to a prime mover. And whatever that original origin point is, which doesn't actually exist, it's infinite, that's the prime mover, which underneath definition four would be God. However, this doesn't really meet my criteria, and so we're not going to use it. Definition five, I'm going to get into a little bit deeper. Uh, this is the manifestation of a non-literal God. Uh, that is, the God doesn't actually exist as a conscious being like I exist or a human exists, uh, certainly. But it manifests itself through a common belief system and the actions of its believers. Uh, this one is literally true and provable, uh, but it's not my main argument. But for the sake of it, let me explain why this definition of God is undeniably real and is actually influencing the world you exist in right now without a shadow of a doubt. So step one, a person exists. I think this is a philosophical foundation that actually doesn't require much speculation. Uh, if you don't believe that people exist, uh, I don't know if we can actually foundationally argue anything. But, okay, so a person exists. And then this person goes to a church or a place of worship. When they attend the place of worship, who knows why they went, the place of worship teaches them a common doctrine or a system of belief. In this case, the church teaches them the doctrines of the Holy Bible. If the person believes or accepts the common doctrine or system of belief as true, and trust me, this happens, people believe in religions without objective proof, you know, the guy says, yep, it sounds true to me, then he acts as though the doctrine or belief system is true, whether or not it's literally true. To reiterate that, regardless of the actual literal truth of the doctrine, the person is going to act as though it is true. These actions of the believer then literally shape the world. So let's consider this on a more macro scale. For instance, if you have an entire society of people who believe that a supreme being can see everything they do, say, and think, and they also believe that this being is judging them and will punish or reward them for their actions, they're all going to act as if there really is a supreme being watching everything they do, say, or think and waiting to judge them and punish or reward them for their actions. Because everyone believes in the omnipresent judge, they act as if there is an omnipresent judge, regardless of whether or not the judge exists. Again, the collective action of the believers manifests consequences on the world. These consequences are in practice identical to if the omnipresent judge really existed, regardless of its literal existence or non-existence. It does not matter whether the omnipresent judge is actually there. The consequences of their actions are going to manifest as if it is there. And this collective worship of a potentially imaginary ideal will regardless manifest something that is tangibly real. Okay, so back to definition three, the one that I'm really trying to argue. Why do I personally believe in a literal, non-imaginary, supreme being who manifests consequences that are tangibly separate from those of belief alone? I'm going to lay out four foundations for this. 
this is where I'm gonna get kind of sloppy and predominantly get speculative. Um, I really am a little limited here in my little monkey brain and my ability to actually lay these foundations out. However, these are the foundations that I run off in my own personal belief system and are the reason why I believe that there is a supreme being. First, I believe the universe is spatially slash temporally infinite. That means it's without end. That means there is no end to space and there is no end to time. Second, I believe life must arise from the universe. Third, I believe the universe principally organizes itself from chaos into growing levels of higher order. Fourth, I believe that with these foundations, God will necessarily exist. So let's go over the spatial slash temporal infinite universe. In this diagram, you have a center point. Pick any point in the universe, it's space. No matter what, in three dimensions, outside of this space, there is an infinite amount of space. You cannot hit the end of space, because if you were to hit a limiting barrier of space, let's say an invisible wall or a skybox, like in a video game, what would exist outside of that barrier would be more space. No such thing as, as nothing, because nothing is space, right? You can't say space ends, because that would imply you know, that something else that isn't space exists outside of the space. But that something that isn't space that exists outside of the space exists. And what exists outside of the something, you know, it goes on and on, that's because it's infinite. This is why space does not end. Secondly, time does not end. If space does not end, that means it never begins and it never ends. You can never reach the start of it, you can never reach the end of it. That means time is also infinite. Why? Because as long as the infinite space exists, time is passing. Time exists. That means there is no start to time, and there also is no end to time. However, as time moves, or as things move across the plane of time, things change. This is where we find finite, because matter that which exists within the infinite space and within the infinite time is finite. There is not an infinite amount of matter based on my current conceptualization. However, the finite is able to rearrange itself across time and space. For instance, I gave you an example here. At one point in time, the matter has arranged itself as a fetus. At the other point in time, the fetus has grown into an old man who will soon die. Matter started as a fetus and rearranged itself across infinite time and across infinite space into the old man. And then when the old man dies, it will rearrange itself back into subatomic particles and cells. Finite matter, though, means that there are a finite number of possible arrangements of that matter. You can't if you have a hundred Lego blocks, let's say that's all the matter in the universe in this thought experiment, you can't arrange a hundred Lego blocks in an infinite number of new arrangements. Eventually, you will have arranged the hundred Lego blocks in every single possible arrangement. Not to say that that's a very small number, but it's still finite. So my next foundation was that life must arise from the universe. So, you take all of this finite matter, and you shove it into time, right? So, way back in time, what does the matter do as it's traveling along time? Uh, and I also put time here as a circle, because even though the time is infinite, you can never find the start or you can never find the end, the matter is going to follow patterns along it that will inevitably repeat. That ties back into the finite number of arrangements of matter. No matter what, the matter can only be arranged in a certain number of ways. That means that there is a pattern. So, somewhere, way back before us, or well, concurrently to us, matter starts off as subatomic particles, and sub-subatomic particles, and probably sub-sub-subatomic particles. But anywho, something that takes up space and has mass. These subatomic particles rearrange themselves into a higher order as atomic particles as time moves. 
As time continues to move, they arrange themselves into elements and more complex atomic particles. These complex atomic particles rearrange themselves into another higher order of being, automatically as time moves. This is molecules. These molecules rearrange themselves as time moves into two other things. Celestial bodies, or inorganic structures, stars, planets, rocks, meteors, moons, everything that exists that is not alive, and organic matter, or self-replicating matter, nucleotides, DNA, nitrogenous bases, and everything that goes into the creation of life. No matter what, this matter will eventually, across infinite time and space, arrange itself in the exact higher order of being that gives you the emergent properties of reproduction. This leads to the next higher order of being, which is cellular or unicellular life. And what is unicellular life but several pairs of organelles arranging themselves in a higher order of being to create another stage of something? These cellular lives eventually, across time, arrange themselves into multicellular lives. These, over time, arrange themselves into increasingly complex forms of multicellular life. I put a lamb here as a, you know, more complex form of multicellular life than the tadpoles, and the chimpanzee as a more complex form of multicellular life than the lamb. So then eventually you hit us, the Homo sapien. The big ape, the hairless one, the one with the big prefrontal cortex, what you probably are. I don't know that's what you are, but you probably are it. And you're a pretty goddamn complex arrangement of matter that is arranged across several layers of higher order being from that first sub-subatomic particle, which is still within you. What do the human beings do? We arrange ourselves into higher orders of being through our social hierarchies. I put a little simplified picture of feudalism here to tell you what a social hierarchy is. We arrange ourselves into a larger, more congruent being. What happens when that larger hierarchy becomes one being? When the individuals, just as the individual cells, became you, when all of the yous become one you. Well, I, I put some pictures here, like, you know, NSA, DeepMind, AI, singularity is the word on the tip of my tongue here. What happens when the many become one? That is what life does automatically across time. That's what I mean when I say it's a cyclical pattern of matter rearranging itself from chaos into order. It's a hierarchy of being that develops across time. So, <clears throat> with these foundations, God will absolutely necessarily exist. If matter is finite and follows a patternable set of behaviors across infinite time, and these patterns have had an infinite number of iterations to occur before our own, that means life has happened an infinite number of times, across an infinite number of universes, and has an infinite number of attempts to organize itself into higher structures of being. What will the final product of this infinite algorithm be, even if it is only successful at reaching the highest possible level of order in one universe out of an infinite number? What do I mean when I say highest possible level of order? This means when you take the finite matter and arrange itself in the most ordered or in the highest level of order where every single piece of matter from the sub-subatomic particle to the celestial body is arranged into one life form. That is what I mean when I say the highest level of possible order. Well, to try and predict what's going to happen when that universal algorithm reaches that point, let's go back to definition one of God. The next stage that comes after human, or after what comes after after human, or what comes after 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 human in an infinite number of iterations of the universe, would be something akin to those pagan gods. Uh, you know, a hyper-advanced being that's not necessarily a supreme being. And it's also possible that 
even millions or thousands or dozens or several of these could simultaneously exist within the same universe and be combating or cooperating with each other to attempt to unify into higher orders of being. <clears throat> what is common amongst all of it, even this next stage, is that it's trying to organize more matter into more of itself. So, what occurs after an infinite number of iterations where one of these beings eventually is successful and turns every single particle of matter in the entire universe into itself? You get the supreme being. The highest possible order of being. Since there's no start, and it's been cyclically... <coughs> Let me go. So since it had no start, time that is, and it's been cyclically, cycling, excuse me. Since time has no start, and it's been cycling forever before us, that means God already existed. Doesn't necessarily exist, but I kind of feel like the Supreme Being would be able to keep itself existent across multiple cycles. This means God, the Supreme Being, most likely exists concurrently to our cycle of the universe, and is able to actively influence and change the universe we inhabit. That's the ruler aspect of the Supreme Deity. It exists concurrently to our universe and is able to directly affect it or have consequences upon it. This is equivalent in Christian mythology to God the Father, the omnipresent, omnipotent being. So I also said that God the Father was its own prime mover. This is because, since it's existed for an infinite amount of time, it is its own causal agent. It is what caused the universal cycle that created itself. We are currently inhabiting this self-caused universal cycle that is actively creating the God that caused the cycle, concurrent to the previous existence of God. This is equivalent in Christian mythology to God the Son, we are the creation of God the Father. The creation, that is, is crucified, which means suffering, as it is rising, or risen, to heaven. That heaven means the supreme being, an eternal state of transcendental nature free of suffering. These two cycles exist concurrently and eternally to each other. God the Son, us, is eternally being risen to God the Father, who concurrently, eternally exists. This is the transcendental nature of consciousness and the true dissolution of the ego. And it is why I, 